Over 25 years ago, a young and hungry competitor by the name of Rocky Mavia took to the WWF for his first ever match in 1996. From there, this fresh-faced young man would begin a life-changing transformation into becoming perhaps the biggest superstar to ever come out of professional wrestling. As he becomes The Rock, the once-in-a-lifetime charisma started oozing out of him. Multiple world titles, millions of dollars in merchandise, and catchphrases that have stood the test of time catapulted him into the mainstream, and his popularity soared past pro wrestling as the great one entered Hollywood, becoming one of the biggest movie stars of his generation. Yes, if you're watching this video, then chances are you already know who Dwayne the Rock Johnson is, but perhaps you don't know the full story. Before making billions in the box office, The Rock had to force his way into the mainstream through his time in the squared circle. So let's take a look back at the iconic career of the most electrifying man in sports entertainment. This is the story of The Rock in WWE. But before we get to his debut in 1996, let's first take a look back at The Rock's roots in pro wrestling. Growing up, the wrestling industry surrounded him with both his father, Rocky Johnson, and grandfather, Peter Mavia, carving their own legacies in the ring. Surrounded by this and a natural desire to be involved in sports, The Rock quickly decided that he would take a crack at pro wrestling. And of course, this wasn't an easy decision to make due to his prior success in college football, but he still chose to pursue pro wrestling due to his love for the business. And with his upbringing being surrounded by wrestling, he quickly took to it during his training. He impressed so much that he actually got handed a few tryout matches for WWF only a year after his first day of training. And there, after competing for a few house shows, Dwayne was signed to the WWF. And with him continuing to honor his family legacy, Dwayne would make his debut under the ring name Rocky Maivia, a combination of his father and grandfather's ring names as he was hyped up to be WWF's first third generation superstar. Yes, he was heavily pushed during his first few weeks in the company, as his first match took place at the all-important Survivor Series event, and there he competed alongside Mark Miro, Jake Roberts, and Barry Windham to take on Crush, Goldust, Jerry Lawler, and a young Hunter Harst Hemsley. Yeah, Triple H himself was involved in Rocky's first match for WWF, which is rather interesting given what they would go on to do together during the Attitude Era, but we'll get to that later. For now, Rocky was given a major push, acting as the sole survivor for his team after eliminating the final two members of the opposing group by himself. Yeah, he was quickly on the rise in the WWF, going on to soon win the Intercontinental Championship from Hunter only three months after his debut on Raw. However, wrestling fans could see right through this push by the WWF. Rocky, still relatively new to the business, still felt off with the fans as many believed he wasn't quite ready for the spotlight. Ironically enough, his early career reminds me of what would go on to happen to his cousin Roman Reigns in 2015. This pure white meat babyface character wasn't doing him any favors with crowds feeling as though the character and the push that went along with it was unfit for Rocky. Walking into WrestleMania 13, despite being the IC champion, his popularity was starting to wane, and despite this match, Massive push against an equally massive monster in the Sultan, fellow Anawaii family member Rikishi under a different ring name, Rocky was still struggling to truly get over with the crowd, and he even had his father Rocky Johnson alongside him during his match at WrestleMania, which perhaps saved him from the boos he would soon receive in the following weeks. During the rest of his reign, Maivia would routinely retain the title via countout against some of WWF's most beloved babyfaces, including Bret the Hitman Hart. Chance of Die Rocky Die would soon start to overtake his matches with fans turning on the young competitor as he soon lost the IC title to Owen Hart on the April 28th edition of Raw. And following this loss, Rocky would suffer an injury a few weeks later, which took him out of action for about three months. In his absence, Rocky got to thinking about his career. Sure, he walked in and was handed plenty of success, but he also realized that to the fans, his short burst of glory meant pretty much absolutely nothing. They still booed him and they still wanted him gone from WWF, and Rocky brought that feeling of bitterness upon his return. During a match on Raw, Rocky made his return through the crowd to assist the Nation of Domination's own, Farouk, to pick up a victory. After the match, Rocky would plead his allegiance to the group joining Farouk, D'Lo Brown, and Kama. Afterwards, he explained his heel turn as one brought on by the fans. No matter what he did, no matter how accomplished he was in his young career, the fans still chanted, Rocky sucks. So, since the fans didn't respect him, he decided that he didn't respect the fans. In these promos, Rocky Mavia started to grow more into the rock that we know today, with his with him improving week in and week out as he molded his egotistical character. 
Alongside the Nation of Domination, Rocky was able to transform with feuds against the likes of the Legion of Doom and Ken Shamrock. But The Rock's whole career trajectory would change in the late months of 1997. In the build-up towards D-Generation X in your house, The Rock would look to reclaim the Intercontinental Championship, a title then held by Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin, now on his climb towards the main event scene, had already begun his iconic rivalry with Mr. McMahon during his reign as champion, with The Rock just adding fuel to the meteoric rise of the Rattlesnake. At that In Your House event, The Rock challenged Austin to a fight for the title, with Austin successfully retaining after he drove down to ringside in a pickup truck, taking out the rest of the nation. However, on the following episode of Raw, The Rock was surprisingly given the title by Austin, who believed that he had grown above the championship. Yep, in a move that seemed a bit odd even today, Steve Austin chose to forfeit the title to The Rock in order to turn his attention towards becoming a world champion in the future. But despite the lackluster reasoning, The Rock had become the Intercontinental Champion for the second time in his career, and this time, the boos that The Rock received were actually what the company wanted. And he would continue to holding that championship for quite a while as a highlight of WWE's stacked upper mid-card scene. During the run, The Rock would continue his feuds with both Steve Austin and Ken Shamrock as the company entered 1998. After defeating several other members of the Nation of Domination, Ken Shamrock was able to challenge The Rock for the Intercontinental Championship at the Royal Rumble event in a losing effort. And to add even more credibility to the rising star, The Rock would end up as one of the two final competitors in the Royal Rumble match, last being eliminated by Steve Austin after surviving all the way from the number four position. Yep, The Rock was surely being given every opportunity possible to succeed as he started slowly breaking out into WWF's next big single star. But he had quite a ways to go before he would officially leave the nation. Yes, despite the growing tension within the group around this time, The Rock still had his vicious stable in his corner, as we saw heading into WrestleMania 14. However, it was obvious that this very tension would end up boiling over soon, as at No Way Out of Texas, following their loss in a 5 on 5 war of attrition match, The Rock was seen shoveling fellow nation member Farouk in frustration. But The Rock still had WrestleMania to think about, and he had a hungry Ken Shamrock to contend at the event, and both men, after months of fighting, put on an absolute brawl as they battled all throughout the arena. And despite the interference from the nation at ringside, Ken Shamrock was able to pick up the victory by making The Rock tap with an ankle lock. However, a simple win for Shamrock wasn't enough for him, so he continued to attack his foe after the match, and Farouk did walk down to the ring, looking as though he would save The Rock from the beatdown, only to turn his back on him and allow Shamrock to continue the post-match assault. But after Shamrock started attacking the ringside officials who tried to stop the attack, the match result was reversed to have The Rock retain his championship. Once again, The Rock was able to steal another victory and keep a hold of the title. And while Ken continued his rivalry with The Rock, Farouk would also begin his own feud with the Intercontinental Champion after leaving the Nation of Domination. Feeling as though The Rock's ego had grown out of control, Farouk looked to put an end to the Brahma Bowl once and for all, and around this time in the build-up to the Over the Edge pay-per-view, the Nation of Domination, alongside their newest member in Owen Hart, would begin a rivalry with D-Generation X. Faction warfare was brewing throughout Monday Night Raw, all while The Rock desperately held onto his championship while Farouk continued his pursuit towards the gold. And as at Over the Edge, the Nation of Domination would stand defiant as The Rock successfully retained his title against Farouk, putting an end to their rivalry. The Nation was also able to defeat DX in a separate six-man tag match that evening. However, with faction warfare steadily growing in the background, The Rock wanted to continue his meteoric rise to the top by winning the King of the Ring tournament. And after defeating Triple H, Vader, and Dan Severn, The Rock made his way into the finals as he took on his old rival, Ken Shamrock. And with no love lost between them, Ken Shamrock was able to once again beat down his enemy before forcing The Rock to submit to the ankle lock, winning the tournament. But despite losing the tournament, The Rock was still Intercontinental Champion, and he still had a huge target on his back. And with the war between DX and the nation continuing to build, it was only a matter of time before Triple H would end up challenging for The Rock's title. After weeks of back and forth between the two teams, as DX dressing like the nation, complete with an uncomfortable amount of blackface, the match was made. At fully loaded, The Rock and Triple H took to the ring in a 2 out of 3 falls match over the IC title. However, to the disappointment of the crowd, this match would end in a time limit draw, meaning that The Rock was once again able to keep a hold of the championship. 
The two teams continue to taunt each other over the next few weeks, leading to a street fight between DX and The Nation on August 17th episode of Raw. And there, The Nation picked up the victory after The Rock rammed a ladder into Triple H's face, causing him to bleed from the mouth. And backstage after the match, Triple H's anger had reached a boiling point as he challenged The Rock to a ladder match for the championship at SummerSlam. There, the two would put on arguably the biggest match of their respective careers by that point, with each person's respective faction given time to shine. There, both men impressed fans all over the world as they looked to prove just why they were the next big stars in the WWF. And in the end, China was able to help Triple H gain the title by low-blowing The Rock to the excitement of the crowd. Finally, after The Rock used the Intercontinental Championship to rise up the card, Triple H was able to begin his own climb towards the main event scene off the back of The Great One. However, with this loss, the rest of the Nation of Domination realized that The Rock had outlived his usefulness, and that, as well as the growing upwell of support from the fans for The Rock, led the Nation to finally turn their backs on him. After his ego and character grew into such a massive name in the WWF, the Nation chose to drop him before The Rock would start his turn towards the light. Now, with the respect of the fans, The Rock chose to align himself with guys like Steve Austin, Ken Shamrock, and Mankind against Mr. McMahon's corruptive authority, properly establishing himself as the good guy in front of the eyes of the fans. However, it's never easy to be the enemy of the boss, as Vince realized that he was quickly becoming outnumbered in the company. Seeing that the numbers were stacking against him, Mr. McMahon decided to create some animosity between those looking to fight against him. While Steve Austin battled against both Kane and The Undertaker in the main event of Breakdown in Your House, House, the Rock found himself in a triple threat steel cage match against Shamrock and Mankind as they fought for a shot at the WWF Championship. There, The Rock was able to earn his shot at the title, but unfortunately unable to actually challenge for it due to the controversy surrounding the WWF title at the time. You see, at breakdown, both Kane and Undertaker were able to pin Steve Austin at the same time, leaving Vince no choice but to make a match between the two at the following month's Judgment Day pay-per-view event for the vacant title. And while The Rock would ultimately lose his own match at Judgment Day against Mark Henry, the WWF title would be put on the line between the Brothers of Destruction and the main event. And there, the match ended in more controversy as neither Kane nor The Undertaker left with the title due to Austin's typical rebellion as the special guest referee. Due to all the confusion surrounding the WWF title, there was, and with no official champion being crowned for the second straight pay-per-view in a row, Mr. McMahon decided to create a tournament for the vacant title title known as the Deadly Game Tournament. Twelve men waged war at Survivor Series, with The Rock essentially being targeted by Vince in the build-up to the show. By this point, The Rock had become the people's champion, which only angered Mr. McMahon due to his own hatred of the WWF fans. However, throughout the show that has been defined as Vince Russo's masterpiece, The Rock had a few interesting moments throughout. For starters, he was able to defeat the big boss man in a quick three second long match as he rolled up his replacement opponent in a previously injured Triple H. Then, later on in the evening, he was able to defeat Ken Shamrock after Big Boss Man looked to help Shamrock by throwing him a nightstick, only for The Rock to perfectly intercept the catch and use it on his rival. Afterwards, in a semi-final match against The Undertaker, Kane would interfere to hit The Rock with a chokeslam, giving him yet another victory, this time via disqualification. Three times in a row, The Rock had gotten the job done, albeit with each victory having some sort of asterisk in one way or another, but that leads us to the main event final between The Rock and Mr. McMahon's right-hand man in Mankind. However, in a massive swerve, The Rock would end up leaving Survivor Series with the WWF Championship. In a recreation of the Montreal Screwjob from the previous year's Survivor Series, The Rock landed Mankind in a sharpshooter before Mr. McMahon ordered the referee to ring the bell and award the victory to The Rock, despite Mankind not actually tapping out to the hold. After the match, The Rock would deliver a rock bottom to Mankind as he aligned himself with the McMahons. The Rock was now on top of the world, with Mr. McMahon's endorsement no less, and he was even handed his own pay-per-view event titled Rock Bottom, with The Rock being forced to compete against Mankind for the title after Commissioner Shawn Michaels gave him another shot at the gold. A furious Mankind knew that he had one more shot at the title, and he looked to give himself every possible advantage leading into the match. Before the show on Sunday Night Heat, Mankind attacked the champion in order to damage his ribs heading into the big match. And this attack, along with the litany of offense throughout the bout, led Mankind to the victory, or so he thought. 
After forcing The Rock to pass out in a mandible claw, the referee called for the bell and Mankind was declared the winner. However, before Mankind could be announced as the new champion, Mr. McMahon took the microphone and explained that because The Rock did not submit to the hold, The Rock would remain the WWF champion. Yep, in an almost reverse of the Montreal Screwjob-like angle from the prior month, Mr. McMahon helped The Rock retain his title, despite actually losing to Mankind. Furious at being screwed out of the WWF Championship twice now, Mankind demanded a rematch for the title, and he would receive it on the first episode of Raw in 1999. There, the pro wrestling landscape would forever change as Mankind, after some help from DX and Steve Austin, won his first WWF Championship. This moment has lived in wrestling infamy as this episode, due to its pre-taped nature, was spoiled by the live WCW Nitro show happening at the same time. However, what WCW did not realize was that the idea of Mankind winning the WWF Championship would be so exciting to those watching Nitro that many of them would actually change the channel and head over and watch the massive title change. This moment would be huge in the trajectory of the Monday Night Wars as the beloved Mick Foley would leave that episode of Raw with the biggest prize in sports entertainment. And of course, The Rock wouldn't just accept this loss lying down, so he demanded a rematch against Mankind at the Royal Rumble event a few weeks later, and this time with the match contested as an I Quit match. In a match that now lives in infamy as well, The Rock brutally assaulted Mankind throughout the match. During the bout, Mankind was handcuffed and unable to defend himself as The Rock smashed a steel chair into his head over and over and over again. 11 brutal chair shots to the skull later, and Mankind was still reluctant to quit the match. However, a few moments later, The Rock held the microphone up to the unconscious lips of Foley, with his voice being echoed throughout the arena as fans all over the world heard him say, I quit. But in reality, Mankind never said those words. It was revealed later on that a recording of Mankind saying, I quit, taken from an earlier promo, was played over the loudspeakers to make it look like he had said the words. Once again, The Rock had stolen the WWF title from Mankind. But once again, The Rock had to deal with an angry Mankind, so a few weeks later, the two would have another vicious battle in an empty arena match at the Halftime Heat event, taking place during the Super Bowl 33. There, Mankind would recapture the WWF title after famously trapping The Rock underneath a forklift. I'm sure many of you have seen that clip at some point. After trading the title back and forth, both Mankind and The Rock wanted to put a definitive end to their feud at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre event in a last man standing match. However, while Stone Cold Steve Austin was named number one contender for the WWF title in his main event steel cage bout with Mr. McMahon, the question of who he would be facing at WrestleMania 15 was still left in the air by the end of the night. So after yet another back and forth fight between them, Mankind and The Rock would knock each other out simultaneously hitting each other with their own steel chairs. But since neither man was able to answer to the count of 10, the match would end in a draw with Mankind looking to walk into WrestleMania as the champion. But to finally crack a definitive champion heading into WrestleMania, a ladder match was held between The Rock and Mankind on Raw, and there, following interference from a freshly debuted Big Show, The Rock was able to steal the title and walk into the main event of WrestleMania as the WWF Champion. However, it wasn't going to be an easy battle for the champion, as the odds began to stack against him. Not only did he have the Texas Rattlesnake to worry about, but it was also revealed that Mankind was the special guest referee for the bout, and before the match started, Commissioner Shawn Michaels made the announcement that the corporation was banned from ringside. The Rock was truly on his own with this one. Austin had even gotten the one up on him the previous episode of Raw by spraying the entire corporation in beer in another iconic segment, which I'm sure you guys have also seen the clip for that. And with nobody left to help him in his corner, and with his confidence left in critical condition, Stone Cold would defeat the Great One to end WrestleMania 15 as WWF Champion. However, following WrestleMania, The Rock continued his rivalry with Steve Austin over the title, but Austin didn't want to hold the classic WWF title, no. He and instead wanted his own personalized Smoking Skull Championship, which had been previously stolen from him by Mr. McMahon to replace the design of the WWF title. McMahon, after being threatened by The Undertaker, agreed to give him the title to the behest of the rest of the corporation, so Shane McMahon decided to steal the Smoking Skull Championship back from Austin, giving it to The Rock. And from there, in a mirroring of their segment with the Intercontinental title a few years prior, The Rock would throw the Smoking Skull off a bridge in Detroit and he then proceeded to throw Austin himself into the river, with a Texas rattlesnake disappearing into the waters below. 
The following week, during a fake funeral segment held by The Rock, Austin returned to crush The Rock's limousine in a monster truck. Yeah, we were in the peak of the Attitude Era's craziness, with the Austin vs. Rock feud taking us to backlash. And there, despite a no disqualification stipulation, and despite Shane McMahon's role as the special guest referee, The Rock would be unsuccessful in his pursuit to take the title back from Austin. The following night on Raw, The Rock was shockingly betrayed and fired from the corporation, turning him face once again. And from there, he began a feud with Triple H, The Undertaker, and the corporate ministry. As soon as he lost the title, The Rock was dumped by the corporation in exchange for their next big star in Triple H. The Rock's feud with Triple H essentially would build over the next few weeks as he looked to get revenge on the group. During that time, the first episode of SmackDown would take place, named after The Rock's Lay the SmackDown catchphrase. And there, he teamed up with Austin to take on the new corporate group on top of the WWF. But The Rock had his eyes specifically set on Triple H after he injured The Rock's arm. However, at Over the Edge, The Rock got his revenge by defeating Triple H despite the injury. And Triple H would soon look for revenge on The Great One on the June 7th episode of Raw, which saw The Undertaker hit a tombstone pile driver on The Rock on a steel chair. And sure, The Rock won via disqualification, but this attack only looked to piss him off, and at King of the Ring, The Rock challenged Taker for the WWF Championship in a losing effort due to a Triple H interference. In the weeks after, the feud between Triple H and The Rock would continue with both men looking for a shot at the WWF title, so at Fully Loaded, the two heated competitors went to war in a strap match to become the number one contender, and there, Triple H's ally, Billy Gunn, would cost The Rock the match, allowing Triple H to pick up the win. And from there, we get to the burial of Billy Gunn. I'm just kidding. I'm not, but I am. So anyway, around this time, Billy Gunn was starting a slow ascent up the card as a singles competitor with The Rock looking like a great launching pad for his career. So at SummerSlam, the two fought in a kiss my ass match. However, throughout the build, The Rock's unmatched charisma was only unfortunately exposing Billy Gunn with each passing week. Don't get me wrong, Billy Gunn was a fun character to watch around this time, but unless you were already positioned as a major deal in the WWF, it was going to be hard to stand toe to toe with The Rock. So at SummerSlam, the Billy Gunn experimental push seemingly died as The Rock got the victory. Soon after his victory over Billy Gunn, The Rock would begin a rivalry with the WWF Tag Team Champions and The Undertaker and Big Show, and while he was willing to go to war with the two giants of WWF by himself, an unexpected partner would come in in the form of an old rival. Mankind would march down to the ring, coming face to face with the same man that hit him over the head with a chair 11 straight times earlier in the year, and chose to stand alongside him as they formed The Rock and Saw Connection. From there, the newly formed act would would win the tag titles heading into Unforgiven, quickly becoming one of the most over duos in the company. But both men would end up opposing one another at Unforgiven as they, along with Big Show, British Bulldog Kane, and Triple H, competed in a six-pack challenge for the vacated WWF title won by the game himself, Triple H. However, following this main event battle for the gold, the Rock and Sock connection would appear once again in easily the most famous segment during their run as a team. The now christened This Is Your Life segment Segment, took over Raw as well as the hearts of millions, with The Rock and Mankind's lovability oozing throughout the segment. This segment became one of the highest rated in Raw history as Mankind comically ran through The Rock's life, with fans all around the world laughing as they watched two of the most charismatic wrestlers in history. However, despite showing a more comedic side to his character, The Rock was still involved in the main event scene of the WWF. His feud with Triple H continued on through to No Mercy during the game's match with Stone Cold Steve Austin for the the WWF title. There, as he went to target Triple H with a sledgehammer shot, The Rock would accidentally hit Steve Austin with a sledgehammer to give his rival the win. And because of this interference, a triple threat match was made between Triple H, Steve Austin, and of course The Rock for the WWF title at Survivor Series. However, earlier in the show, Steve Austin was hospitalized after being ran down by a mysterious car in the parking lot. In one of the most egregious cases of WWF lying to its fans, the whole show was themed around this triple threat main event, despite WWF knowing that Austin would be unfit to compete weeks before the show. But because of this attack, the big show was chosen to replace Austin in the main event before picking up the victory and walking out with the championship. It was kind of ridiculous. Following this loss, The Rock decided to once again enter the tag team scene alongside Mankind as they looked to recapture their previously lost WWF tag team titles. And at Armageddon, they were able to recapture the gold by defeating the new 
Age outlaws, all while the McMahon Helmsley regime formed over the prior weeks. This new group, consisting of Triple H, Stephanie McMahon, X Pac, and the New Age outlaws, would soon target The Rock and Sock Connection as the duo spoke up against this new faction. The New Age outlaws won back their tag team titles before Mick Foley decided to go at it alone and target Triple H's WWF title. But as for The Rock, he would look towards his own single success during the Royal Rumble match, looking to once again main event WrestleMania. And after entering the match at number 24, The Rock would last eliminate Big Show in order to win that year's Royal Rumble. However, this victory came with some controversy. During the elimination, it was obvious to those watching that The Rock's feet touched the floor before Big Show's in the elimination, and this spun off into a feud between The Rock and Big Show as they fought at the following month's No Way Out pay-per-view over the rights to be named number one contender. However, The Rock would ultimately lose this match after Shane McMahon hit the great one with a steel chair for Big Show to take advantage. The Rock was screwed out of his main event shot of the WWF title, with many fans hoping that their beloved hero would replace Big Show in the match. Due to the controversy surrounding the WWF title scene, a fatal four-way elimination match was scheduled to main event WrestleMania 2000. Dubbed the McMahon in every corner matchup, each competitor had a McMahon representative. Triple H had his wife Stephanie, Big Show had Shane, The Rock had a recently returned Mr. McMahon who came back with a hatred for Triple H and Stephanie, and Mick Foley, after previously being forced into retirement by Triple H, had Linda in his corner. Linda McMahon, that is. In the end, the final two competitors were Triple H and The Rock, and just when The Rock looked to have finally won the title, a shocking swerve took place when Vince McMahon hit The Rock with a steel chair. From this, Triple H took advantage in order to retain the title as he closed the show alongside his father-in-law. Of course, this swerve only proved to piss off the Brahma Bull, and at the Backlash event a few weeks later, The Rock once again challenged Triple H for the title, with everything stacked against him, including Shane McMahon as a special guest referee. The Rock was able to secure the victory via the assistance of an interfering Stone Cold Steve Austin, and after taking out the rest of the McMahon-Helmsley regime, the two biggest rivals of the Attitude Era celebrated with The Rock and Steve Austin ending the night with a couple of beers. The feud between The Rock and Triple H continued into Judgment day the following month as the game challenged his foe to an Iron Man match. However, in a twist that only angered Triple H, the heartbreak kid Shawn Michaels returned to act as the special guest referee for their match. But after an interference from the rest of DX on Triple H's behalf, a shocking return would take place in the form of The Undertaker, now debuting his American badass gimmick. Taker launched an attack on DX, hitting Triple H with both a choke slam and a tombstone pile driver as the time limit expired. Unfortunately for The Rock though, this attack would give Triple H that last point he needed to overtake him in the match. So despite looking to take his frustrations out on the game, all Taker really did was just hand him the WWF title. Yeah, this is one of those odd booking choices in hindsight, with Triple H now being placed on top due to the accidental help of Taker. But when Triple H now had the WWF title, he also gained several high-profile rivals in The Rock, The Undertaker, and a returning Kane. So at the following month's King of the Ring event, a six-man tag team match took place with the stipulation that if a member of The Rock's team got the pinfall at the end of the match, regardless of who it was, that man would be the WWF champion and the team of The Rock, Kane, and Taker were able to defeat the trio of Vince, Shane, and Triple H as The Rock pinned Vince to recapture the gold. The Rock would continue to hold on to the title throughout Fully Loaded, where he retained his championship against Chris Benoit, who had aligned himself with Shane McMahon over the prior few weeks. And sure, during the match, Benoit looked to actually beat The Rock for the title. However, the new WWF commissioner, Mick Foley, would restart the bout before The Rock was able to pick up a decisive victory over the rabid Wolverine. Afterwards, The Rock walked into SummerSlam as the champion, and on Raw, a triple threat number one contenders match took place between Kurt Angle, Triple H, and Chris Jericho. However, during the bout, both Angle and Triple H simultaneously pinned Jericho, making them both the number one contender. So at SummerSlam, The Rock was forced to take on both men in a massive triple threat that saw The Rock retain following a people's elbow on Triple H. But if The Rock thought he had it bad here, that would be nothing when compared to his main event match at the following month's Unforgiven pay-per-view. There, he successfully defended the title in a fatal four-way that saw him take on The Undertaker, Kane, and Benoit. 
Yes, for multiple pay-per-views in a row, The Rock walked in only to leave with the title despite insurmountable odds. And after beginning a partnership with Chris Benoit, Kurt Angle was able to use the assistance of his new ally to defeat Triple H in a number one contenders match on Raw, thus granting him a shot at The Rock's title for no mercy. However, while The Rock had to contend with Kurt Angle as his next challenger, he also had to worry about a newly returned Stone Cold Steve Austin, because after being hit by a car the year prior, Austin has made his return to the company to hunt down whoever ran him down, and in an odd twist, it was revealed that Rikishi was the one to attack Austin. He did this, citing that he did it for his fellow family member, The Rock, in order to help him stay on top of the company. The Rock, however, rejected this, stating that he had no idea why the attack took place, but while Steve Austin was able to get his hands on Rikishi in a No Holds Barred match, the main event WWF title match still took place between The Rock and Kurt Angle. There, the two went to war in a no disqualification match as Stephanie McMahon stood by in Kurt's corner. Throughout the match, Stephanie would continuously distract both the referee and the champion before The Rock finally laid her out with a rock bottom. And after seeing his wife get hurt, Triple H stormed down to the ring to attack both The Rock and Kurt before carrying Steph to the back. Following this interference from the game, both men resumed the bout only for Rikishi to interfere on The Rock's behalf. However, this plan backfired with Rikishi accidentally hitting The Rock before receiving an angle slam. Kurt then took advantage of Rikishi's accident by hitting The Rock with an angle slam as well and becoming the new WWF champion in the process. Due to Rikishi's interference in his match, The Rock began a feud with Rikishi heading into Survivor Series. After Rikishi was revealed to not be the true man to attack Steve Austin with Triple H claiming to be the mastermind be behind the whole thing, The Rock still chose to take out his anger on Rikishi after costing him the WWF title. And and at Survivor Series, The Rock would get his revenge by defeating Rikishi before promptly being attacked by him after the bell rang. But with so much chaos surrounding the WWF title once again, so many people felt like they deserved a shot at the gold. While champion Kurt Angle clutched to that title with every fiber of his being, he could see the entire roster painting a target on his back as The Rock, Triple H, Steve Austin, The Undertaker, and Rikishi had all climbed the WWF mountain to qualify for a shot at the gold. So, Commissioner Mick Foley would come up with a horrifying solution. At Armageddon, a six-man Hell in a Cell match took place featuring all the men listed in a war for the title. And quick side note, but I really want to see a six-man's Hell in a Cell match again, bro. I don't know why we haven't seen that. Anyway, also, despite Mr. McMahon's wishes, the six men put all their bodies on the line for a chance to take home the title. And this match was absolutely insane, with the biggest spot of the match being The Undertaker's chokeslam to Rikishi off the top of the cell onto the back of a truck at ringside. But despite all the chaos, Angle was able to keep a hold of the title heading into the following year. However, with Angle continuing his feud with Triple H over the title, The Rock once again found himself lost on the road to WrestleMania. So he set his goal to enter the Royal Rumble match in order to somehow end up in the main event of WrestleMania 17. But unfortunately for him, he was eliminated by Kane before Steve Austin was able to win the match. The Rock knew he had only one one more chance in order to main event WrestleMania. He had to become the WWF champion. And after winning a number one contenders match on SmackDown, The Rock got a shot at Kurt Angle at no way out. And there he was able to recapture the gold in the main event as he looked to head towards WrestleMania. But now The Rock had to once again come face to face with his old rival, Stone Cold Steve Austin. For Steve Austin especially, that title meant everything to him as his chance at the title was stolen from him time and time again, notably by The Rock, Rikishi, and those close to him over the years like Mr. McMahon. But that desperation took Steve Austin to perhaps the darkest place he had ever been as his desire forced him to do what nobody thought was possible. Near the end of the bout, Steve Austin's longtime rival, Mr. McMahon, took to the ring, and in a massive swerve, Mr. McMahon would actually hand Austin a steel chair to use on his opponent, with Austin turning heel to join Mr. McMahon and become the new WWF champion. The following night, Steve Austin Descendant to Darkness only continued during a steel cage rematch against between Austin and The Rock over the title. There, Triple H would align himself with Steve Austin in an attack on The Rock, 
forming the two-man power trip, and this attack would also write the rock off television for several months as he filmed The Scorpion King. In his absence, the invasion storyline would develop with WCW and ECW going to war with the WWF, but like a knight in shining armor, The Rock would return on the July 30th edition of Raw, aligning himself with the WWF against the invading rival companies. From there, he would begin a feud with Booker T over Booker's WCW title. Obviously, by this point, WCW was bought out by the WWF. And in his pay-per-view return at SummerSlam, The Rock successfully captured the WCW Championship in the main event for the first time in his career. This would end up being a huge victory for WWF as The Rock would continue his reign heading into Unforgiven. However, once again, the odds were stacked against him heading into the main event. After weeks of back and forth between The Rock and the duo of Booker T and Shane McMahon, a match was made featuring all three men with Shane and Booker teaming up to take on The Great One in a handicap match for the title. However, despite their best intentions, they were unable to take the championship back from The Rock as he defeated both of his opponents. But The Rock wouldn't only have enemies from these invading promotions. No, there was there were those in the WWF who also had a problem with The Rock as he held the title. Notably, Chris Jericho would begin his own feud with the Brahma Bull in the build-up to No Mercy. There, after winning a number one contenders match on SmackDown, Jericho was able to defeat The Rock following some ringside distraction by Stephanie McMahon, another leader of the invading forces. However, despite this loss, both Jericho and The Rock were forced to put their ever-growing animosity aside for the sake of the WWF. With Survivor Series coming up, the Invasion storyline was set to end with the entire pay-per-view solely focused on this company-wide war. In the main event, The Rock joined forces with Chris Jericho, Kane, The Big Show, and The Undertaker to take on Team Alliance, the name for this evading force, in Steve Austin, Kurt Angle, Booker T, Rob Van Dam, and Shane McMahon. And after months of turmoil, Team WWF would secure victory with The Rock hitting a rock bottom on Austin for the win. The invasion was over, the WWF had won, and it was all thanks to The Rock. But with the WWF now consuming both WCW and ECW to their ranks, a few questions remained. Many fans were left wondering just what would happen with the WCW and WWF world titles. Well, at Vengeance, they found their answer as a unification tournament was held for both championships. Kurt Angle, Steve Austin, The Rock, and Chris Jericho all competed throughout the evening, with Chris Jericho securing a win over both The Rock and Steve Austin in the same night to become the first ever unified WCW and WWF champion. If you've heard any promos over the last 20 years from Chris Jericho, then you've probably heard him mention that night a few times. But after both men's months-long rivalry over the WCW title, The Rock was still not convinced that Jericho deserved to be champion while he waited by the sidelines. So, at the following Royal Rumble event, The Rock challenged Chris Jericho to a match for the undisputed WWF title, only for Jericho to cheat him out of a win via a low blow and a roll-up pinfall. And after losing a number one contenders tournament, The Rock was forced out of the title picture, but as WrestleMania 18 loomed ahead, a recently debuting NWO Stable would start their destruction of the WWF. And after a backstage confrontation between the two at No Way Out, The Rock would come face to face with Hollywood Hulk Hogan on an episode of Raw in the build-up to WrestleMania. There, the two announced a match between them for Mania as the separate icons of the industry look to wage war in the squared circle. Of course, with Hogan now positioning himself as the top heel of the company, he would routinely attack The Rock any chance he got. Hell, he even ran a semi-truck into an ambulance with The Rock trapped inside. But despite these heinous attacks, the match was still set between the two at WrestleMania. However, interestingly, the Canadian crowd would completely change the course of the match as they would surprisingly choose to cheer Hogan due to their nostalgic love overtaking any sort of storyline sense. And with the fever pitch of the crowd, both men put on an electrifying match which saw The Rock pick up the victory over the Hulkster. Afterwards, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall would attack Hogan only for The Rock to save him from the beatdown, turning Hogan into a face in the process. Following his victory over Hogan at WrestleMania, The Rock would take a long absence from WWE. For nearly a year, he was gone from the WWE as he continued his pursuit towards Hollywood stardom before returning in January 2003. This, combined with a negative reaction of the crowd during his match against Hogan, made The Rock question the support of the fans. So, like he did all those years ago, The Rock would turn his back on them in the build-up to his rematch against Hogan at No Way Out. There, the newly heel Rock would once again defeat defeat Hogan after Mr. McMahon would distract Hogan in the build-up to their eventual match at WrestleMania. 
With his new Hollywood Rock persona, The Rock quickly became one of the most dastardly and entertaining heels in the company. His comedic charm against the likes of The Hurricane, as well as his legendary rock concerts, proved that he still had so much untapped charisma. Yes, despite already being seen as one of the most charismatic people in the company, The Rock's new character gave him so much more to chew on as a performer. A fresh new air came with The Rock this time around, with him simultaneously wowing crowds as well as earning their hatred. However, with WrestleMania 19 looming on, The Rock still felt as though he had one thing left to accomplish in the WWE. He's won so much gold throughout his career, he's defeated some of the best the company had to offer, but that still wasn't enough for Hollywood Rock's gigantic ego. He still had one more challenge to overcome in the promotion. He had never beaten Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania. At WrestleMania 15 and 17, The Rock was forced to stare up at the lights as the Texas Rattlesnake celebrated in victory, but now The Rock wanted to get his revenge. And at WrestleMania, two of the biggest icons of the Attitude Era waged war once one last time with The Rock finally getting the victory that he desperately needed, and up until his return at WrestleMania 38, many fans saw this as Austin's perfect final chapter to his career as he unofficially retired from the WWE after this match. The following night on Raw, The Rock came out gloating about his victory over Steve Austin, however, what he didn't expect to find was a debuting Bill Goldberg. Goldberg, one of the biggest stars in the history of WCW, finally made his debut for WWE by interrupting the Great One before hitting The Rock with a massive spear. This led to a match between them at Backlash where Goldberg would defeat The Rock to reposition himself as a major name in pro wrestling. And following this loss, The Rock would leave the WWE behind in order to pursue his acting career full time. Sure, he popped up on occasion, such as his appearance at WrestleMania 20 to reunite The Rock and Talk connection in a handicap match against Evolution, but The Rock was essentially done with pro wrestling. Off to Hollywood, The Rock looked to transform himself into a movie star. But while he was making himself a megastar of entertainment, the WWE grew in his absence off of the back of the next generation of superstars such as Batista, Randy Orton, Edge, and most notably, John Cena. And so, as we fast forward nearly a decade, it was John Cena who had his eyes set on main eventing another WrestleMania event. At WrestleMania 27 now, Cena was walking in as the challenger for the Miz's WWE Championship, but in the build-up to the event, and after weeks and rumors of speculation, some that even included a young Justin Bieber as the host, a special Raw segment was set aside to reveal that the host of WrestleMania would be none other than The Rock. In almost seven years, The Rock returned home to host the biggest wrestling show of the year. In the build-up to the show, The Rock and John Cena would trade a few verbal jabs at one another. As they started cutting promos on each other heading into Mania, many fans were left to start picturing of what it would be like to see them compete in the ring. But before we would ever get to a match of that magnitude, John Cena was still looking forward to his match against The Miz for the WWE title. But these insults between Cena and The Rock would result in a major twist at the end of WrestleMania 27. After The Miz retained his title via a double countout against Cena, The Rock came out as the host to restart that match, calling it a bunch of BS and saying that it needed a definitive end. But The Rock surprisingly hit Cena with a rock bottom, allowing The Miz to retain the WWE title in the main event of WrestleMania. This wasn't just about handing Cena a main event loss. The Rock wanted to make sure he himself had a hand in it. And the growing animosity between Cena and The Rock came to a head the following night on Raw, in which we've never seen before both men would make a huge announcement. At WrestleMania 28, one year later from that moment, the two icons cons of their respective generations would compete in the middle of the squared circle. And this moment sent shockwaves throughout the WWE. Cena throughout the next year always had this major match with The Rock to look forward to as he continues to get ready for what could be the biggest match of his life. And if you were watching wrestling at this time, I know personally I was and WrestleMania 28 actually was my first ever WrestleMania. I was hype. Like 10 year old me was going absolutely insane over this. So, throughout the next year, both men would continue to interact with each other. Notably, the two would end up on the same side of the ring as they teamed up to take on The Miz and R-Truth at Survivor Series. 
And there, the charismatic duo of Cena and The Rock would actually get the job done, seemingly on the same page, heading into the final push towards WrestleMania 28. It was clear that despite their growing animosity for one another, a level of respect was present between both men. However, The Rock decided to fire yet another shot at Cena to close out Survivor Series. Following that match, the face of WWE was left laid out after being hit with the rock bottom. From there, the two would trade back and forth insults over the next few months. John Cena would call The Rock a hypocrite, saying that he had left the WWE behind after building his fame off the back of the company. The Rock, on the other hand, fired back at Cena as he played into the ever-growing hatred of those that despised Cena's position as the face of WWE at the time. All this anger was brought then to the main event of WrestleMania 28, and a back and forth 30 minute brawl took place between both men. In the end though, Cena made a fatal error that cost him the biggest victory of his career. Looking to mock The Rock in, in the closing moments of the match, Cena went to hit his own version of the people's elbow, and there, as Cena ran towards the ropes, The Rock stood back to his feet to catch him in a rock bottom for the win. For the first time in his career in the main event of WrestleMania, The Rock stood tall as Cena sat in sorrow at ringside. And once again, 10 year old me was absolutely crushed as the grown ups around me at the time were absolutely ecstatic. After another hiatus from the company, The Rock made his return during Raw 1000, which was the 1000th episode of Monday Night Raw. There, he attacked Daniel Bryan following another major announcement. He announced that at the Royal Rumble event the following year, he would challenge the WWE Champion for a shot at the gold. Whoever held the title by that point would have to go one on one with the great one. But that was still a good few months away, with the WWE title picture currently being centered around the rivalry between John Cena and CM Punk. In fact, in the main event of Raw 1000, John Cena would cash in his Money in the Bank contract that he had at the time to secure a fair shot at Punk's title. However, Cena was unable to capture the title after Big Show ran down to attack him, resulting in a disqualification. And following the match, The Rock ran down to the ring in order to save Cena from the assault but in setting up the people's elbow on the giant, CM Punk would shockingly re-enter the ring and attack The Rock. The WWE Champion would then hit a GTS on Rock, turning heel on one of the biggest stars in the history of the company. And following this heel turn, The Rock would once again disappear from the WWE as Punk's reign of the, with the WWE title carried on. In fact, Punk would continue to hold the gold heading into the Royal Rumble event, with Punk angry that The Rock, despite barely making any appearances, was able to use his star power to gain a shot at the title. And nonetheless, Punk was still forced to defend his championship with The Rock picking up the victory to once again become WWE Champion. Of course, CM Punk was furious at this outcome with The Rock essentially just walking back into the WWE to end his record setting run as WWE Champion. I remember I was personally pissed because I wanted to see CM Punk finally main event of WrestleMania, but that was a long time ago. Anyway, so Punk demanded a rematch would take place at the following month's Elimination Chamber with the added stipulation that if The Rock was disqualified or counted out, he would lose the WWE Championship. But despite the added stipulation, The Rock was still able to retain the gold to close out the show. The Rock was the top champion of the WWE. I mean, it was literally, what was it, 2013 and The Rock was WWE Champion? That's crazy. Holding the most prestigious title in sports entertainment. And after putting CM Punk away for good, The Rock would begin his journey towards WrestleMania 29 by revealing a new design for the WWE Championship title. And if he wanted to truly keep a hold of that title, then he was going to have to repeat history. You see, the winner of that year's Royal Rumble event was uh, a man named John Cena. So after losing to him the year prior, Cena would finally look to get his revenge on The Rock. Cena blamed Rock for sending his life into a downward spiral, as he felt his life has fallen apart ever since the loss. He failed his money in the bank cash in, he was attacked by a returning Brock Lesnar the night after WrestleMania, he even got a real life divorce. Cena blamed all of this on The Rock, and at WrestleMania he looked to finally gain his redemption, and in the end Cena was able to get the job done to recapture the WWE title as he finally got one up on The Rock. They closed out the show at the top of the ramp with The Rock raising Cena's hand in victory. And for the most part, that has been the end of The Rock's WWE career. Sure, he's made a few sporadic appearances over the years to pop the crowd outside of an impromptu throwaway match between himself and Eric Rowan, which 
yeah, I mean, that was like a six second match. The Rock has remained away from the ring. He's chosen to stay away from WWE, building up his name in Hollywood to become one of the most iconic actors of our generation. His roles in the Fast and Furious, Jumanji, Black Adam, and more have cemented his legacy. He's become arguably one of the biggest stars to ever come from the world of wrestling, and despite his rocky start in the WWF, The Rock's determination and sheer charisma was enough to transform him into a blockbuster megastar. But despite his Hollywood success, The Rock's roots will always be tied to the WWE. His family ties to pro wrestling, and his growth in the industry is ingrained in his soul. And with certain members of his family now leading the WWE, you have to assume that The Rock will be willing to see just what they're made of when the time is right. After all, we did see him recently make a surprise return to the WWE on the September 15th, 2023 episode of SmackDown, so it's only a matter of time to see what he could do next. Perhaps he will continue to stay away, or perhaps he will return to show a certain cousin of his what happens when you disrespect both his family and the business that he loves. But whether he does return for one last run or not, The Rock has already done more more than enough to cement his legacy in pro wrestling. His once in a lifetime charisma has entertained millions of fans with his presence on the show forever irreplaceable. In the Attitude Era, a time where wrestling star power was at an all time high, The Rock forced his way into becoming the biggest talking point of the sport week in and week out. He was and forever will be one of the most beloved stars in the history, one of the most beloved stars in the history of the business as he continues to impress people worldwide. It takes a lot for someone to call themselves the great one and get away with it. It, but The Rock has proven that time and time again. Despite whatever label he gives himself, he's always lived up to it as he remains the most electrifying man in all of entertainment. And if you smell what The Rock is cooking, then you're going to hit that subscribe button. Thank you for watching.